Well, thank you very much, uh, Anne Sophie, and thank you all for coming, and thank you all for having me. It's a, it's a huge honor uh, to be here. For um, several years now, I've been teaching a course to final year undergraduate students in anthropology in our University of Aberdeen. The course is called The Four A's, uh, Anthropology, Archaeology, Art, and Architecture. And part of what I've been trying to do in this course is uh, to mix the usual things of lecturing and having seminars and discussing and reading with practical activities that speak to the issues that we've been talking about. So I want to begin with um, an experiment that I carried out along with uh, the students in the very first week of this course. I should explain that uh, every student has to pick a particular site or a thing, uh, like a, a fountain or a statue or a prominent building or a stone circle, and they're asked to visit that thing every week and attend to certain aspects of it that they're asked to attend to, make notes, take photographs, build a model, and hand in a dossier at the end of the course. So for this experiment, I asked the students to gather a selection of objects that they found lying around the things on which they had chosen for their projects. Let's see if I can work this. Yeah. So they arrived with a motley assortment of odds and ends. There were coins, paper clips, drinks, cans, cigarette butts, a rubber ball, the feather of a seagull, and much else besides. So first, we deposited all the stuff they had brought in a heap in the middle of the floor. So there's part of the heap. We looked at the heap from which a spider scuttled out across the carpet. It had arrived as a passenger with some item, but no one knew from which. Or was it actually a part of the item? Well, picking up each object in turn, we examined it, investigated its form, interrogated the finder on where it was found and why it had caught his or her attention, and attempted to reconstruct the story of how it had fetched up at that particular place. The coins, for example, told of pockets and purses and of countless transpositions from hand to till and back. The paper clips once fastened the documents of a busy official, while the cans, previously filled with liquid, had been held to thirsty lips through which only moments before had been inhaled the smoke of smoldering tobacco. From the tooth marks on its surface, it was evident that the rubber ball, recovered from a sandy beach, had been the plaything of a dog, while a feather, the feather had once graced a bird in flight high in the air. In short, all of these objects evidenced other lives, human, canine, avian. And yet, in becoming objects, they had broken off from these lives, like fallen twigs from a tree, and were left lifeless as so much bric-a-brac stranded on the riverbank. Only the spider escaped. In the following week, I asked the students to return to their project sites and to bring along this time a selection of materials gathered from the surroundings of these sites. This time, many of them came back with containers full of stuff like sand, gravel, and leaf litter. Why containers? Well, because as soon as, as, as we found, as soon as we emptied out the contents, Materials do not, of themselves, stay in place or hold to the bounds of any form and have an inherent tendency to run amok. We're all familiar with Mary Douglas's celebrated definition of dirt as matter out of place, and sure enough, we quickly got our hands very dirty. But this offered an experience of tactility that could not have been more different from the clinical detachment with which we had examined the objects of the previous week. Then it was as if we had worn protective gloves to ensure that there should be absolutely no exchange of substance 
between the object and the hands that held it, nor should it be bent, broken, or squashed. Our concern had been exclusively with the stillness of form, and like detectives, we were at pains to handle every object delicately so as not to tamper with the evidence or compromise its value as data. With materials, on the other hand, the experience of tactility was all about grain and texture, about the feeling of contact between malleable substance and sensitive skin, about dry sand cupped in the palm and running through the fingers, wet mud sticking and caking as it dries out, the rough abrasion of gravel, and so on. Now, I had myself come along with some materials, namely sheets of hardboard and a bucket of wallpaper paste. Having covered the boards with paste, everyone set to work, mixing the materials they had brought and then smearing these mixtures, however they wished, onto the boards. The result was a rather astonishing series of artworks. And I think that what was most astonishing about them was the way in which they registered the traces of movement and flow. On the one hand, the manual and bodily gestures of ourselves as practitioners. On the other hand, the particular flow patterns of the mixtures we had made. I suppose, in retrospect, that we should not have been so astonished by this. After all, it corresponds to our most everyday experience in the kitchen. Next time you are making soup, pay attention to the way your stirring gesture with the spoon both induces and responds to viscosities and currents of the mixed ingredients in the saucepan. What is odd is that studies of the material culture of kitchens have generally concentrated on pots and pans and spoons to the virtual exclusion of the soup. The focus, in short, has been on objects rather than materials. And yet, on second thoughts, this is not a division between what we find in the kitchen, objects here in this cupboard, materials there in that one. It's rather a difference of perspective. Householders might think of pots and pans as objects, at least until they start to cook. But for the dealer in scrap metal, they are lumps of material. Likewise, we could return to the objects that the students brought in for our first session and ask, what would have happened if we had thought, if we had thought of all this stuff as materials? A coin, well, that's copper, and we could have sought to explore its properties by hammering it or seeing what happens when you heat it up or put it in a flame. That is, the flame would turn green. The paper clip. Well, that's a length of wire, and we could unravel it and bend it to other purposes. The drinks can, well, that's aluminium. Feel how light it is. The cigarette butt, well, there is still some tobacco inside. Light it, and it will exude smoke, and the smoke makes trails in the air that bend this way and that in response to the fluxes and rhythms of our own breathing. The ball, that's made of rubber, and by applying pressure with the hands, we can feel its softness and springiness. We could even put it between our teeth and imagine what it feels like to be a dog. And of course, to think of the feather as a material is to recognize that it has grown along with the body of the bird of which it was once an integral part, mingling with the air in flight. In every case, by treating these erstwhile objects as materials, we rescue them from the cul-de-sac into which they had been cast and restore them to the currents of life. Now, this lecture is about bringing things back to life. And its basic argument may be expressed by means of a simple diagram. Ideally, I would draw this diagram on the spot, but I can't do that. So here, hopefully, it's visible. Here it is. Draw two lines. They needn't be straight, indeed you can allow them to meander a little. However, they should proceed alongside one another like the trails left by two people walking abreast. Each line, they're the downwards lines there, each line is a path of movement. 
Let one of these lines stand for the flow of consciousness, saturated as it is by light, sound, and feeling, and let the other line stand for the flow of materials as they circulate, mix, and meld. Now imagine that each of these flows is momentarily stopped up. On the side of consciousness, this stoppage takes on the semblance of an image, like a fugitive suddenly caught in the glare of a spotlight. And on the other side of materials, it takes on the solid form of an object, like a boulder placed in the fugitive's path blocking his passage. On our diagram, we could depict both stoppages by a point or blob on each respective line. Now, draw a double-ended arrow connecting the two blobs. That's the horizontal line in the picture there. Unlike the original pair of lines, this arrow is not the trace of a movement. It is notional rather than phenomenal and depicts a connection of some kind between image and object. So, now that the diagram is complete, I can sum up the argument of this talk. It is to switch our perspective from the endless shuttling back and forth from image to object and from homage, object to image that is such a pronounced feature of academic writing in the fields of anthropology, archaeology, art, and architecture, to the material flows and currents of sensory awareness in which images and objects reciprocally take shape. So in terms of our diagram, this entails a rotation of 90 degrees from the lateral to the longitudinal. And we find this rotation cropping up again and again in various connections. With regard to perception, it underpins the distinction between an optic, optical and a haptic relation to the world a distinction that explains the quite differences of different experiences of tactility that I've just described, showing that the optical relation is by no means limited to a perception mediated by the eye, nor, of course, is a haptic relation limited to the hands. With regard to creativity, it distinguishes the improvisatory creativity of labor that works things out as it goes along, from the attribution of creativity to the novelty of determinate ends conceived in advance. But most fundamentally, it crops up in connection with the question of what it means to make things. We are accustomed to think of making as a project. This is to start with an idea in mind of what we want to achieve and with a supply of the raw material needed to achieve it. And it's to finish at the moment when the material has taken on the intended form. At this point, we say, we have produced an artifact. A nodule of stone has become an axe, a lump of clay, a pot, molten metal, a sword. Axe, pot, and sword are instances of what scholars call material culture, a phrase that perfectly captures this theory of making as the unification of stuff supplied by nature with the conceptual representations of a received cultural tradition. In the literature, the theory is known as, uh, and Anne-Sophie mentioned it, as hylomorphism, from the Greek hyle, meaning matter, and morphe, meaning form. And whenever we read that in the making of artifacts, practitioners impose forms internal to the mind upon a material world out there, hylomorphism is at work. I want to think of making instead as a process of growth. And this is to place the maker from the outset as a participant in amongst a world of active materials. These materials are what he has to work with and in the process of making, he joins forces with them, bringing them together or splitting them apart, synthesizing and distilling in anticipation of what might emerge. The maker's ambitions in this understanding are altogether more humble than those implied by the hylomorphic model. 
Far from standing aloof and imposing his designs on a world that is ready and waiting to receive them, the most he can do is to intervene in worldly processes that are already going on and which give rise to the forms of the living world that we see all around us in plants and animals, in waves of water, snow and sand, in rocks and clouds, but adding his own impetus to the forces and energies in play. The difference between a marble statue and a rock formation such as a stalagmite, for example, is not that one has been made and the other not. The difference is only this, that at some point in the formative history of this lump of marble, first a quarry man appeared on the scene who with much force and with the assistance of hammers and wedges wrested it from the bedrock, after which a sculptor set to work with a chisel in order, as he might put it, to release the form from the stone. But as every chip of the chisel contributes to the emergent form of the statue, so every drop of supersaturated solution from the roof of the cave contributes to the form of the stalagmite. And when subsequently the statue is worn down by rain, the form generating process continues, but now without further human intervention. So to read making longitudinally as a confluence of forces and materials, rather than laterally as a transposition from image to object, is to regard it as such a form generating or morphogenetic process. And this is to soften any distinction we might draw between organism and artifact. For if organisms grow, so too do artifacts. And if artifacts are made, so too are organisms. What varies, among countless other things, is the extent of human involvement in the generation of form. But this variation is one of degree, not of kind. Of course, this is not to deny that the maker may have an idea in mind of what he wants to make. He may even be seeking to copy a piece of work that already stands before him. However, even if the maker has a form in mind, it is not the form that creates the work. It is the engagement with materials. And it's therefore to this engagement that we must attend if we were to understand how things are made. Time and again, scholars have written as though to have a design for a thing, you already have the thing itself. Some versions of conceptual art and architecture have taken this reasoning to such an extreme that the thing itself becomes superfluous. It is but a representation or a derivative copy of the design that preceded it. If everything about a form is prefigured in the design, then why bother to make it at all? But makers know better, and one of my purposes is to bring them out of the shadows into which they have been cast by an uncritical application of the hylomorphic model and to celebrate the creativity of their achievement. Well, on a cold and windy day in February, the students taking our course on the four A's and I were out on a sandy peninsula wedged between the beach and the estuary of the River Don, which flows into the sea on the northern flank of the city of Aberdeen. Patches of snow remained on the ground. We were learning to make baskets out of willow under the direction of anthropologist and craftsperson Stephanie Bunn. To form a frame, an odd number of lengths of willow were stuck vertically into the ground to form a rough circle tied at the top. Horizontal pieces were then woven alternately in and out of the vertical frame so as to gradually build up a surface in the form of an inverted cone. And students worked at this either singly or in pairs. There they are. From the start, I think, many students were surprised by the recalcitrant nature of the material. In a finished basket, the willow seems to sit so naturally there as if it had always been meant to fall into the, that shape and was merely fulfilling the role for which it was predestined. 
But the willow did not want to be bent into shape. Sometimes it put up a fight, springing back and striking the weaver in the face. One had to be careful and coaxing. Then we realized that it was actually this resistance, the friction set up by branches bent forcibly against each other that held the whole construction together. The form was not imposed on the material from without, but was rather generated in this force field, comprised by the relations between the weaver and the willow. Indeed, as novices, we had little control over the precise form and proportions of our baskets. Kneeling on the ground, our weaving involved quite muscular movements of the entire body, or at least from the knees upwards, so that the dimensions of the basket related directly to such bodily dimensions as arm reach and shoulder height. Students discovered that they had muscles in places they had never imagined, partly because after a while they began to ache. But other forces too entered into the formative process, and one of these was the wind. A persistent, strengthening wind was bending all the verticals of the frame in one direction with an inclination that increased with height. No wonder then that many baskets, especially those woven nearest to the shore, tilted over somewhat in an elegant but wholly unintended curve. Well, we labored for almost three hours, gradually developing a rhythm and feel for the material. But as the work progressed, we began to face another problem. How would we know when to stop? There is no obvious point when a basket is finished. The end dawned on us, not when the form came to match initial expectations, for we had none. It came rather with failing light and the imminent prospect of heavy rain, increasing chill and stiffness of the limbs, and the sense that each additional strand was becoming somehow superfluous. At that point, it was time to insert a separately woven base and to cut the verticals at the height we had reached. At last, then, we could lift the woven construction from the ground and turn it upside down to reveal that what we had made was indeed a basket. Each basket was different, uniquely reflecting the mood and temperament as well as the physical stature of its maker. Finally, the students dragged, straggled off into the gathering dusk, proudly bearing homeward the baskets they had made. Later they would tell me that they had learned more from that one afternoon than from any number of lectures and readings. Above all, about what it means to make things, about how form arises through movement, and about the dynamic properties of materials. Well, perhaps it's unfair to use basketry as a way to criticize the hylomorphic model. The conclusion that the model doesn't work for weaving doesn't rule out the possibility that it might work perfectly well for branches of manufacture in which form is more ostensibly imposed on material. What about making bricks, for example? In forming the brick, prior to firing in the kiln, soft clay is pre is pressed into a pre-prepared rectangular mold. The mold, it seems, prescribes the form, while the material, the clay, is initially formless. Surely, as the clay is pressed into the mold, form is united with material just as the logic of hylomorphism requires. But in a thesis entitled L'Individuation à la Lumière des Notions de Forme et d'Information, or individuation in the light of notions of form and information, the philosopher Gilbert Simondon shows that this is not so. For one thing, the mold is no geometric abstraction, but a solid construction that has first to be built from a specific material, and traditionally a hardwood such as beech. For another thing, the clay is not raw. Having been dug out from beneath the topsoil, it has first to be ground, sieved, to remove stones and other impurities, and then exhaustively kneaded before it is ready for use. 
In, molding of, in the molding of a brick, then, form is not united with material. Rather, there is a bringing together or unification of two transformational half chains, as Simon Don calls them, demi-chain de transformation, respectively building the mold and preparing the clay. That is to a point at which they reach a certain compatibility. The clay can take to the mold and the mold can take the clay. At the moment of encounter, when the brickmaker dashes a clot of clay into the mold, the expressive force of the maker's gesture imparted to the clay comes hard up against the compressive resistance of the hard wood of the mold's walls. And thus the brick, with its characteristic rectangular outline, results not from the imposition of form onto matter, but from the contraposition of equal and opposed forces imminent in both the clay and the mold. In the field of forces, the form emerges as a more or less transitory equilibration. So perhaps bricks are not so different from baskets after all. Now, Simon Don's central postulate of individuation holds that the generation of things should be understood as a process of morphogenesis in which form is ever emergent rather than given in advance. As Brian Masumi explains in a commentary on Simon Don's text, this is to assert a primacy of processes, processes of becoming over the states of being through which they pass. Against the form receiving passivity of matter posited by hylomorphism, Simon Don took the essence of matter or the material to lie in form-taking activity. The hylomorphic model, Simon Don concludes, corresponds to the perspective of a man who stands outside the works and sees what goes in and what comes out, but nothing of what happens in between, of the actual processes whereby materials of diverse kinds come to take on the forms they do. It's as though in form and matter, he could only grasp the ends of the two half chains, but not what brings them together. Only a simple relation of molding rather than the continuous modulation that goes on in the midst of form taking activity, in the becoming of things. In their treatise on nomadology, Philosopher Gilles Deleuze and psychoanalyst Félix Guattari have taken up Simon Don's crusade against hylomorphism, and thanks to their influence, the issues it raises are beginning to percolate through to archaeology and anthropology. The trouble with the matter-form model, argue Deleuze and Guattari, is that in assuming a fixed form and a matter deemed homogeneous, it fails to acknowledge, on the one hand, the variability of matter, its tensions and elasticities, its lines of flow and resistances, and on the other hand, the conformations and deformations to which these modulations give rise. In reality, they insist, whenever we encounter matter, it is matter in movement, in flux, in variation, with the consequence that this matter flow can only be followed. Artisans or practitioners who follow the flow are, in effect, itinerants or wayfarers whose task is to enter the grain of the world's becoming and bend it to an evolving purpose. Theirs is an intuition in action. But whereas Simon Don took his key example from brickmaking, Deleuze and Guattari appeal to metallurgy. For them, metallurgy highlights a particular insufficiency of the hylomorphic model, namely that it can only conceive of technical operations as sequences of discrete steps with a clear threshold marking the termination of each step and the commencement of the next. But in metallurgy, these thresholds are precisely where the key operations take place. Thus, even as he beats out the form with hammer on anvil, the smith has periodically to return his iron to the fire. So material variations 
spills out, so material variation spills over into the formative process and indeed continues beyond it, since it is only after forging that the iron is finally quenched. Matter and form have never seemed more rigid than in metallurgy, write Deleuze and Guattari, and yet the succession of forms tends to be replaced by the form of a continuous development and the variability of matters tends to be replaced by the matter of a continuous variation. Instead of the concatenation of discrete operations to which analysts of techniques have given the name chaîne opératoire, we have here something more like an unbroken contrapuntal coupling of a gestural dance with a modulation of the material. Even iron flows and the smith has to follow it. So when scholars talk of the material world, or more abstractly still, of materiality, what do they mean? Put the question to students of material culture and you are likely to get contradictory answers. And let me offer a few instances. The first comes from Christopher Tilly on the topic of stone. Contemplating a stone in its brute materiality, those are Tilly's words, he perceives a formless lump of matter. Yet we need a concept of materiality, he thinks, in order to understand how particular pieces of stone are given form and meaning within specific social and historical contexts. Andrew Jones, likewise another archaeologist, holds that the notion of materiality both encompasses the material or physical component of the environment and emphasizes how these material properties are enrolled in the life projects of humans. Nicole Boivin tells us that she uses the word materiality to emphasize the physicality of the material world and yet this physicality embraces the fact that it offers possibilities for the human agent. And introducing a collection of essays on the theme of materiality, Paul Graves Brown asserts that their common focus is on the question of how the very material character of the world around us is appropriated by humanity. So in every case, there seem to be two sides to materiality. On the one side is the raw physicality of the world's so-called material character. On the other side is the socially and historically situated agency of human beings who in appropriating this physicality for their purposes are alleged to project upon it both design and meaning in the conversion of naturally given raw material into the finished forms of artifacts. And this duplicity in the comprehension of the material world precisely mirrors that to be found in much older debates surrounding the concept of human nature, which could refer at once to the raw substrate of basic instinct that humans were alleged to share with the brutes and to a suite of characters, including language, intelligence, and the capacity for symbolic thought, by which they were said to be elevated to a level of being over and above that of all other creatures. The appeal in these debates to the human nature of human nature did nothing to resolve this duplicity but only served to reproduce it. Indeed, the very notion of humanity epitomizes the predicament of a creature that can know itself and the world of which it is inextricably a part only by taking itself out of that world and reinscribing itself on another level of being, mental rather than material, or cultural rather than natural. And in just the same way, in the notion of materiality, the world is presented both as the very bedrock of existence and as an externality that is open to comprehension and appropriation by a transcendent humanity. So materiality, like humanity, is Janus-faced. Now, it's not my intention, as the archaeologist Björn Olsen alleges, to eliminate the word materiality from our vocabulary or to ban its use. 
just as with humanity, it would probably be rather difficult for us to manage without it. But we do need to be wary of the assumptions that this word tends to bring in train, most particularly, as the geographers Ben Anderson and John Wiley warn, most particularly that the material world has by nature such properties of obduracy and consistency of shape as define the state of a solid. Olson himself falls prey to this assumption when he appeals to the world's hard physicality. Why so hard? Why so solid? Consider, for example, an ordinary pot. In its time, it has seen service in numerous campaigns from when it was first made to when, cracked and discarded, it was returned to the earth, only to be uncovered thousands of years later in an archaeological excavation. Yet through all of that, has it not remained steadfastly what it was? Was not the pot, as the hard and physical thing it is, always a pot? Not so, answers archaeologist Cornelius Holthoff in his Notes on the Life History of a Pot Sherd. For the pot's materiality, he claims, is no more and no less than the ways in which throughout its history it was variably enrolled in human life projects. It could, in principle, be anything anyone wanted it to be. But in this very claim, Holthoff lurches from one side of materiality to the other, from the physicality of matter to the forms of its social appropriation. And this move does nothing to soften, liquefy, or enliven the material. If the pot has a life history, and this could be either short or long, depending on whether we count from the moment of manufacture to that of discard or to that of eventual recovery, if the pot has a life history, it is not the history of a life intrinsic to the stuff of which it is made. It is of the human life that has surrounded it and given it meaning. Well then, how about an artifact of flaked stone? Like the pot, the stone would also have had its moments, at least three, according to the prehistorian Jeff Bailey, when it was acquired, when it was worked into the form of an artifact, and when the artifact was eventually discarded. To these could be added a fourth moment, when it was recovered by an archaeologist, a fifth, when it was illustrated in a publication, and any number of mo possible moments thereafter. These moments are known to posterity only because they leave a material trace, and the artifact presents itself, according to Bailey, as an accumulation of such traces for which he reserves the term palimpsest. He even goes so far as to claim that the materiality of a thing, such as a stone artifact, is by definition that aspect by which it outlasts the active moments of its formation or inscription. It is a kind of negative imprint of the formative process. And yet this is to revert once again to the hylomorphic characterization of materiality as form receiving passivity rather than form taking activity. Or in short, whether we find the history of things with Holthoff in the life that surrounds them or with Bailey in the traces that remain in them after life has moved on, it seems that in the appeal to materiality the becoming of materials, their generative or regenerative potential, indeed their very life, has fallen through the cracks of an already solidified world. So what then is matter? What do we mean when we speak of materials? Are matter and materials the same or different? To understand the meaning of materials for those who work with them, be they artisans, craftsmen, painters, or practitioners of other trades, I believe we need, as the art historian James Elkins recommends, to take a short course in forgetting chemistry. Or more precisely, we have to remember how materials were understood in the days of alchemy. Elkins's point is that prior to the introduction of synthetic paints, the painter's knowledge of his materials was fundamentally alchemical. To paint was to bring together into a single movement 
a certain material mixture loaded onto the brush with a certain bodily gesture enacted through the hand that held it. But the science of chemistry can no more define the mixture than can the science of anatomy define the gesture. The chemist thinks of matter in terms of its invariant atomic or molecular constitution. Thus, water is H2O and salt is sodium chloride. For the alchemist, by contrast, a material, a material is known not by what it is, but by what it does, specifically when mixed with other materials, treated in particular ways, or placed in particular situations. Among innumerable other things, water gurgles down a spout, turns to steam when heated and to ice when cooled, and dissolves salt. And salt, inter alia, can be ground into fine white grains that pass through the holes of a dispenser, prevents the freezing of water on roads and pavements, and gives a distinctive flavor to food. The archaeologist Chantal Connella introduces her recent discussion of the archaeology of materials by comparing two definitions of gold. One comes from a chemistry textbook, the other from an 8th century Persian philosopher alchemist. For the chemist, gold is one of the elements in the periodic table and as such has an essential constitution that is given quite independently of the manifold, manifold forms and circumstances of its appearance or of human encounters with it. But for the alchemist, gold was yellowing and gleaming and anything that yellowed and gleamed and it would also shine ever brighter under water and could be hammered into thin leaf would count as gold. Now one way to accommodate these divergent understandings of what is ostensibly the same material would be to argue with the design theorist David Pye for a distinction between the properties and qualities of materials. Properties for Pye are objective and scientifically measurable Qualities are subjective. They are ideas in people's heads which they project onto the material in question. But this would only be to reproduce the duplicity in our understanding of the material world between its given physicality and its valorization within human projects of making that we are seeking to resolve. The experienced practitioner's knowledge of the properties of materials like that of the alchemist, is not simply projected onto them, but grows out of a lifetime of intimate gestural and sensory engagement in a particular craft or trade. As Connella argues, different understandings of materials are not simply concepts set apart from real properties. They are realized in terms of different practices that themselves have material effects. But precisely because these practices are so variable and have such different effects, Connella warns, we should avoid the temptation to turn understandings drawn from one particular context of material technical interaction into a meta theory for everything else. Our task should rather be to describe and analyze every case in its ethnographic specificity. For this reason, while broadly sympathetic to attempts by scholars such as Simondon, Deleuze and Guattari, and even myself, to overthrow the logic of hylomorphism, Connella is also critical of their tendency to select just one field of practice as a lens through which to view all others. So where Simondon bases his argument on the operations of brickmaking, Deleuze and Guattari feel equally free to generalize across the board from metallurgy. Metal, they say, is coextensive to the whole of matter and the whole of matter to metallurgy. If even metal flows, then so, they say, do wood and clay, not to mention grass, water, and herds. For my own part, I've drawn on the practices of basketry to adv advance a rather similar argument about how the forms of things of all sorts are generated in fields of force and circulations of materials that cut across any boundaries we might draw 
between practitioners, materials, and the wider environment. In a certain sense, then, we can say that the smith at his forge or the carpenter at his bench is actually weaving. Even the bricklayer could be said to weave as he knots bricks with mortar into the fabric of a wall to create a regular and repeating pattern. This is not to pretend that there is no difference between the properties of willow, iron, wood, and clay, or that the skills of the basket maker are no different from those of the smith, the carpenter, and the mason. It is rather to focus on what it means to say of practice that it, that it is skilled or of materials that they are endowed with properties, whatever the field of practice or the materials involved might be. Another case in point is the understanding of stone, a material that has been of particular interest to archaeologists, not least because of its alleged hardness, solidity, and durability. Indeed, these properties have been so often highlighted as to make them seem all but universal. If you want to build a monument that lasts, then hard stone is the appropriate material to choose. But we cannot assume that just because the stony elements of what is nowadays recognized as an archaeological monument have endured, while all the other materials that may have been used in the construction have long since rotted away, we can't assume that this is what the original builders intended or the reason why they chose to incorporate stone into the construction in the first place. For all we know, stone may have been selected by people in the past not for its solidity and permanence, but for their opposites, namely fluidity and mutability. No doubt the flint nappers of old in the manufacture of stone tools valued the hard edge. However, the alchemically informed painter values soft stone, which can be ground into ochre for its color. Some kinds of stone are heavy, others light. Some are hard, others soft and crumbly. Some separate into flat sheets, others can only be split into blocks. All things considered, concludes Connella, it is clear that there is no such thing as stone. There are many different types of stone with different properties, and these stones become different through particular modes of engagement. But it's not clear whether this typological splitting of generic stone into innumerable subtypes will take us any closer to, our, to a resolution of our original, initial question, what is a material? As the Swiss architect Peter Zumthor writes, material is endless. This is what he says. Take a stone. You can saw it, grind it, drill into it, or polish it. It will be a different thing each time. Then take tiny amounts of the same stone, or huge amounts, and it will turn into something else again. Then hold it up to the light, different again. There are a thousand different possibilities in one material alone. But if there are as many different kinds of stones as there are possible ways of engaging with them, then, as even Connolly is obliged to admit, no two stones can ever be quite the same. And taken to its logical conclusion, the project of classification would leave us with as many subtypes as there are stones in the world, and we would still not know what stoniness means. Indeed, any attempt to produce a classification of materials in terms of their properties or attributes is bound to fail for the simple reason that these properties are not fixed but continually emergent along with the materials themselves. The properties of materials, as I've argued elsewhere with specific reference to the stoniness of stone, are not attributes but histories. Practitioners know them by knowing their stories of what they do and what happens to them when treated in particular ways. And such stories are fundamentally resistant to any project of classification. Materials do not exist in the manner of objects, as static entities with diagnostic attributes. They are not, in the words of philosopher of science, Karen Barad, little bits of nature 
awaiting the mark of an external force like culture or history for their completion. Rather, as substances in becoming, they carry on or perdure, forever overtaking the formal destinations that at one time or another have been assigned to them and undergoing continual modulation as they do so. Whatever the objective forms in which they are currently cast, materials are always and already on their ways to becoming something else. Always, as Barad puts it, already and ongoing historicity. So materials are ineffable. They cannot be pinned down in terms of established concepts or categories. To describe any material is to pose a riddle whose answer can be discovered only through observation and engagement with what is there. The riddle gives the material a voice and allows it to tell its own story. It's up to us then to listen and from the clues it offers to discover what is speaking. To return to my earlier example, I yellow and gleam and I shine ever brighter under running water. What am I? The answer is evident to the panna without his having to name it, for it lies there glinting in the bed of the stream. So just as in the case of panning for gold, to know materials we have to follow them, to follow the fl matter flow as pure productivity, as artisans have always done. Their every technical gesture is a question to which the material responds according to its bent. In following their materials, practitioners do not so much interact as correspond with them. Making, then, is a process of correspondence, not the imposition of preconceived form on raw material substance, but the drawing out or bringing forth of potentials imminent in a world of becoming. In the phenomenal world, every material is such a becoming, one path or trajectory along a maze of trajectories. So it's in this sense that we can agree with Deleuze and Guattari that materials evince a life proper to matter, albeit one that is hidden or rendered unrecognizable by the terms of the hylomorphic model which reduce matter to inert substance. It's in this life, they argue, in the imminent power of corporeality in all matter and the esprit de corps accompanying it, it's in this that the relation between making, as in basketry, brick making, or metallurgy, and alchemy is to be found. In the act of making, the artisan couples his own movements and gestures, indeed his very life, with the becoming of his materials, joining with and following the forces and flows that bring his work to fruition. It is the artisan's desire to see what the material can do, by contrast to the scientist's desire to know what it is, that, as political theorist Jane Bennett explains, enables the former to discern a life in the material and thus ultimately to collaborate more productively with it. So returning to the diagram with which I began, to see what the material will do, to collaborate with it, or in our terms to correspond with it, is to read making longitudinally rather than laterally. Only by doing so, I contend, can we bring materials back to life. Thank you very much.